Good morning. I used to work at Toys R Us, uh, if you remember, where it used to be up on Harrisburg Pike, God rest it, um, <laughs> during high school. And you know, I remember occasionally there would be a, a little child named Ryan who would be causing trouble with their parent or something like that. So when I heard a mother call out to the child, Ryan, I would always sort of like instinctively you know, look over. You know, I thought to myself later, I'm like, well, that's really dumb. Like, I mean, I know that that's not my mom's voice, and I know that I'm right here and not causing any, well, yeah, not causing any trouble at the time. But there's something about that call. Like, it, it's just, yes, that's, that's my name. Although, when I got older and began to have things that I needed to call call centers about, a very rare and wonderful joy um, that many of us experience. And somebody would call me Mr. Fisher, I'd be like, <laughs> that's my father. You know, a, a lot of people say that. They say when they first hear that, they think like, well, no, no, that, that's, that's one of my parents. That's not me. These two things are, are, are kind of important for us because God does call you by name and entrusts you with the mission, which is really what we're celebrating today. But very often, and I did this for many years, I thought of myself as just, yeah, a fully initi initiated member of the church, but not one of the ones that was responsible for anything. You know, I'm not really up to that par. I'm just sort of like your everyday disciple. I'm not the one that's going to be doing anything meaningful. This is what keeps a lot of people out of ministry, is because they just think they're unworthy of it, or that I'm not destined for something like that. I'm to remain here. This is my spot. You know, what I think is fundamentally wrong about that, especially for the fully initiated Christian, is that God has said something different. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to ever be caught in a place where God is saying one thing and I'm saying, you have no idea what you're talking about. I know better than you. Because what God does for each of our brethren here to be confirmed is to really assign them the official task of the mission. We know you have the Holy Spirit. We know that was placed within your souls at the gift of of your baptism, but through the time from then till now, the church, your community of faith, your parents, your guardians have attempted to raise you in that faith and have led you and walked with you on the way to this moment here, which is a significant one one that is echoed by our scriptures. But that baptism is very much like the seed in our gospel, a very appropriate gospel chosen for us today because that seed is very liberally given. If we think about the one who is sowing in that parable, it is really just tossed everywhere, even into places where there's rocks, even into places where there's not good soil we see this powerful generosity of God being given to everyone who seeks him. The seed of that baptismal word spoken to your soul is your awakening, is that moment in which God has really set the foundation for you. That's the name. That's being called by name. Just as you will recognize your name all the way through your life when it is called, whether that person is calling you particularly or not, we must recognize God's fundamental call of you, which at baptism was your call to be holy. That's everybody's first vocation in our church today. Everybody's first and primary vocation is holiness. We see in our psalm an echoing of a very powerful and deep calling. This goes very hand in hand with our first reading from the prophet Isaiah. 
a very confident one, very much different from any of those times where we ever said about ourselves, well, the church wouldn't want me for that. I couldn't do that. Or I'm not worthy to be that. All these things in which we consider ourselves just simply lesser members of the church, not to be fully engaged because God wouldn't want that, is contradicted again by God's Word. The psalm suggests that the one who bears the good news actually makes all of creation rejoice. Now, why would this be the case? It very much personifies poetically all of God's creatures and even the works of creation themselves rejoicing because the bearer of good tidings is here, because the one who is speaking the word of God is here. Because creation, as the spiritual tradition of our church would say, inherently knows when the crown jewel of creation, when the human person has come to understand him or herself perfectly and understood that mission, that creation itself responds we see this a lot in what Jesus says. You know, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, be uprooted, or move, and it would move. Say to this tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. These powerful words also reflect upon our gospel a little bit. What has God planted in you? And how much water am I giving it? What kind of seed do I think it really is? God only gave me a, a lesser portion of himself. No. As Isaiah says, as is contradicted to many of our low expectations of ourselves, the anointing is upon me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor. Essentially, this reading saying, this message is for mission. This anointing is based in mission to announce, to herald the Lord's salvation to those who most need to hear it. Now, first of all, that might be us. And there may be some days where we do feel quite anointed, quite well equipped to be proclaimers of the word, and other days where we feel like, I really need to hear that word. I really need to know and be lifted up in that word again. This is why we surround this sacrament with the scriptures, with the liturgy, with the community of faith, with our brothers and sisters in the communion of saints who also gather here with us. The point of the anointing is for your mission. Now, this is not a God who likes to give blessings and take back. This is a God who likes to give blessings and have them stick. You received in baptism a mark upon your soul which cannot be removed. This sacrament does the same thing something that is marked upon you forever and for eternity. God doesn't just do that lightly. But who are we to think God would want to plant a permanent mark upon something he didn't really care about or wanted nothing from? The power of how that's lived out is seen in St. Paul's words to the Corinthians, talking about the variety of spiritual gifts because we will all contribute to the kingdom and the coming of the kingdom in a variety of ways. Sometimes it's only left to be discovered how it is God will work through us, but we do have to be real about that. In our lives, we have to actually expect it and to trust it, that even if it seems like everyone else doesn't quite appreciate our dignity or gifts or talents, the most important opinion is God's. The most eternal opinion is God's, the one who has chosen to anoint you. This anointing is definitely powerful throughout our scriptures, throughout the history of salvation, and just as we say in our prayers today, this is the same spirit 
the same outpouring that the apostles received at Pentecost. People who were afraid, people who felt like they were failures, like they had abandoned Jesus, because many of them literally physically did. And some, like St. Peter, in words of denial. This is a really powerful exclamation point to us in our liturgy as we renew those baptismal promises. Do you believe that this Spirit is given to you uniquely today just as it was given to the apostles at Pentecost? That's a pretty heavy thing to believe, but if we say we believe it, that means we take the second place. God takes the first place. Not my assessment, not my own plans, not how I have believed, perhaps, about who I am in the church, what my gifts can be for the church, but what God says they can be. St. Paul also confirms us in the fact that there is one body with many parts, all of us sharing in the same spirit, believing in the same Lord, and members of the same body. You bear saints' names today that you admire in order to spiritually connect you with those who have truly run the race, who have fought the good fight, who have been truly humble, understanding their littleness before God, but also understanding God's greatness. Those two combine together to equal a real understanding of the self. It is only then that you can be, as St. Catherine of Siena says, be who God meant you to be and you will set the world on fire. A profound sentiment, truly a lofty goal, but something we are all capable of. So just as when somebody calls you Mr. or Ms., when they're talking to you about something and you think they're referring to your parents, when God refers to you with this name today through the priest anointing you, he's calling forth you, not someone else, but you to take up the mission. He entrusts you with this mission, and this is one of the most difficult things, I think, to keep in our minds and to fully understand, is that even though we are sinners, God continues to entrust the mission to us, that God chose to leave it up to us to spread the gospel. He chooses to leave it to you. He calls you today. He confirms you in your vocation to holiness. We pray today that good fruit will be born by you. Also, that you may know that you are valued in the community of the church, that you have gifts that can be used for the service of God's mission to save souls. Your profound calling today is one that can bring souls to eternal life. A lofty goal indeed, but something also that is worked out in every moment of our life in saying yes to God and yes to what the Holy Spirit desires of us. We pray today for you. We ask God to give grace to you today to fulfill what was begun in your baptism and to empower you truly to be in wonder about what God and what great things God can do through you in this life to find their fullness in the eternal life of heaven.